Well, first we'll kick it off by welcoming everyone here to join us. Um, Iris was just mentioning, you know, how how awesome it is to be able to share knowledge and help. And, and Alex had mentioned it too. Like we we don't always have to have to struggle to find information or um, you know have to figure it out ourselves. We have a wonderful network and a wonderful community that is here to support you. Um, and so that's that's what it's all about. Um, you guys know me, I think Patty and, and, you know, we know Iris, um, we will have some time, I think in the chat, especially to share, uh, what your business is and anything you're having challenges with. So we won't do any, um, kind of round table today. Um, but I do want to introduce you to our guest speaker, Alex Bruno. So Alex, I got this from your website. And so just, you know, bear with me, everyone. So Alex helps entrepreneurs and business owners in their growth by taking care of their legal needs. He's an entrepreneur himself. He understands the various responsibilities and time limitations entrepreneurs experience daily. His approach is designed to streamline a business's legal needs, anticipate and eliminate issues and set a framework for businesses to meet their goals. Alex graduated from UCLA Law School in 2000. He was inaugural member of the school's Epstein program in public interest law and policy and received his undergraduate bachelor of arts degree in history from UC Berkeley. And he currently serves on the board of directors for the Glendale Chamber of Commerce uh, and devotes his time as a board member for Family Promise of the Verdugos, a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting homeless families regain their independence. Uh, and one last kind of plug for Alex, or a couple of plugs, but I'm sure he'll share too. Um, this is the value of networking. I met Alex, I think, probably through Twitter first, and then um, we happened to go to an event together and it was just very kind. And I mentioned to him that my son was interested in becoming a lawyer and he's like, well, call and like, let me know where I'm happy to connect with him and super generous with his time. Um, but he also has a podcast and it's called, what is it called again, Alex? Bismode. Bismode, the Bismode podcast. So um, definitely, you know, check that out too. Lots of um, more tips and, um, you know, interviews, different entrepreneurs and things like that. So I want to make sure you guys know about that. Um, Iris, anything else before we kick it over to Alex? No, I'm super excited to hear what he has to say. And I think that the great thing about having these kind of discussions is we can meet you where you are. So no matter where you are in your business, um, you know, it's a small group. We can be vulnerable um, and ask the questions that could really help you. So don't hesitate um, to ask questions, even if you are a little shy about it. Yes. And for those of you that submitted questions in advance, we do have those. So um, as Alex is going through, we can refer back to that. Feel free to ask um, personally as well. Um, but we shared some of your businesses with Alex so that he's aware of, you know, the variety and things like that. So uh, Alex, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Thank you both for, for having me and for thinking about doing this presentation. Um, you know, just some housekeeping. I am at home. So if it gets noisy, let me know and I'll let you know as well. If I do drop off from like in terms of internet, definitely let me know in terms of like, if you didn't hear something, I'll repeat it because it's because some of this information is important. Um, and, you know, I just want to start by congratulating everyone on this, on this Zoom, because it really takes a lot of courage to try to pursue a passion. And that's what all of you are doing. And a lot of people don't make this leap. A lot of people just always think about it and never execute. You all are in some stages of execution. So you really should give yourself a lot of ton of props and just, you know, just congratulate yourselves because we don't congratulate ourselves enough. And that's a big thing because a lot of us, again, dream about something but never even start. So the fact that you started, you're already like halfway through the game. So congrats again on that. Um, okay, I'm going to go with the share. So we're going to do a little business law 101 today. Um, you know, we're going to talk about three general areas, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, by the way, this is a picture of me about five to six years ago. So you can see less gray. Um, I haven't changed it, so I need to change that. Um, I'm actually at a different office. That's another story for another topic. But I'm the founder of Bruno Group Inc., which is my law firm. I'm also the founder of Bizmode, which is basically kind of, we talked about the podcast, but it's really kind of where I'm on to transition my firm to 
Um, that's my kind of like end goal is, is, is biz mode, which is there's always legal involved, but we, we do a lot more than just legal. Uh, so, you know, when we're marketing to like the startup community, we're marketing to the tech community, you can sometimes use Bizmode over Bruno Group. Essentially, it's the same thing. And it's probably like some of you who have different brands under your under your umbrella. So, so think about it this way. Phone number's there, my email's there. Again, this is a nice picture of me from circa 2017, 2016. Again, I missed that, that hair. Like, I still got the hair, which is... You know, we all love our old pictures of ourselves, uh, Alex. You don't have yeah. to move on. <laughs> <laughs> but but that no, the, the 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 gray speckles are not, are not there. But anyway, <laughs> that's enough about me. Okay, that's enough. Okay, let's talk about you all and what we're going to talk about today. We've got three big topics we're going to talk about. I'm going to leave time for I'm going to leave time for us to you know to ask those those questions that have been asked and also to chat about other things that might come up during the talk. But I want to talk about business entities today, which is a very important topic. Is like what should I be or what am I? legal requirements that you have to operate a business in California. Um, that's important for us to talk about as well. And then liability issues that you may face as a business owner. Okay, so we're going to talk about these three things. Um, a lot of it's, it's fun stuff. It's fun stuff for me. That's why I do this. So, um, but that's what we're going to talk about. And from, from what I've seen so far, and what, I, you know, I talked to Patty and Iris before, is we have people in various different ways. We have people in, in doing, doing retail stuff. They're actually selling goods. Um, and we have people who are providing services. So it's really cool to have this mix here. And we're going we're gonna to touch upon how it applies to some of you all differently. Um, feel free to interrupt me if you need to, if it's really pressing. Um, but of course, like I said, we'll have, we'll have time to chat afterwards. So you started. Now what are you going to do, right? So you just started. Let's just say you started, right? So what are you going to do? Last thing you want to do is talk about legal compliance, which is talking about being like, you know, Am I legit? Am I, do I seem legit? Am I doing something legal or illegal? Because you already got other stuff to worry about. You got to worry about, you know, marketing to your new, new and existing customers, fulfilling the orders and the services that you already agreeing to provide those customers. If you have people helping you out, how do I, how do you take care of those people? I make sure they get paid. How do you make sure you get paid? So the last thing you want to do is talk about legal, but we got to talk about legal. Um, I know you got you know 24 hours of, of in a day, and you really you're already trying to cram 72 hours into 24 hours. But you know what? My goal here for today is for to give you a takeaway, which is going to help you hopefully ease that burden a little bit. All right, because here's a, here's a, here's a reason why. Here's a big here's a big uh, what what do they say? The stick, the carrot of the stick. So the the, the, the stick is if you don't do it, you can get in trouble. <laughs> For lack of a better way to say it, right, you can get in trouble, which means, you know, you can owe money to a certain government agency, a lot more money than, 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 than you'd want to owe. So let's talk about, let's talk about some, some ways we can avoid that. But first, let's talk about business entities. So I did a list of business entities in here. I'm not going to talk about all of them, and I'll tell you which ones I'm not going to talk about, uh, specifically professional corporations, but for the sake of, uh, um, of where's Noemi? She was in here for a second. For the sake of, like, Noemi who's a therapist, uh, out straight out of Long Beach, actually. Uh, for the sake of, uh, professional corporations are a little bit different than other, other companies in that if you're licensed for certain things in the state of California, they're going to require you to be a special corporation. Most of you, it doesn't apply to most of you um, unless you have like a special license. Like myself, I'm a lawyer. My is a therapist. There's, there's some of us that have to have, we can only be professional corporations. So some of this cool stuff that we're talking about here, we can't do it because California's Kind of mean. So there you go. Anyway, let's talk about start first talk about what a sole proprietorship is. Sole proprietorship is if you're one person, uh, you can go out and do a business tomorrow. It's basically you doing business on your own. What's the cool thing about that? Well, the cool thing about that is there's not a lot of requirements. You can just go ahead and start on your own. You don't have to worry about doing any filings or anything like that. Uh, you don't have to worry about um, other kind of registrations. Of course, if you didn't want to use your name, if you wanted to use like like something called Bismode, right? So you want to use Bismode, I have to go to the like the county and what we get a what we call a DBA, a fictitious business name, which is Alex Bruno wants to do business as Bismode. I actually took it a step further. I, I, I got a trademark for it. So that's 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 a little bit different. But if you're using a name other than your legal name, that's one requirement you have to do. But if you're a sole proprietorship, what's the disadvantage of being a sole proprietorship? The big one that I always like to talk about is 
you're you're when you do stuff in your business, you're going to be personally liable for anything related to your business. So that means if something goes wrong in your business, they can come after you personally. That can become an issue. Why? Well, if you own a house, if you have like, you know, if this is like a, a side hustle for you or like a gig that you're, you're, you're starting to develop and you have retirement accounts and stuff like that, something goes really bad, someone sues you um, and they, they, they win like a lawsuit against you, well, they can come after you personally. So a lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people are kind of worried about that, right? Another thing is from a tax perspective, if you're getting a lot of money uh, as a sole proprietor, uh, you have to claim that you'll claim that on your on your forms, but that's all seen as self-employment and as self-employment. Now, now, if we get a tax professional here in the future in your community, that they're going to help explain some of this stuff. But just from my lawyer side, it's self-employment is a higher tax level. That means you're paying like a higher tax level. So anyone who's ever got 1099, um, you know, like if you talk to your tax person, they'll be like, why are you paying some? Why, are you, you know, why aren't you doing something else to offset it? Oh, those are two disadvantages of being a sole proprietorship. But, but the, again, going back to the advantage of proprietorship, sole proprietorship is, you know, it's really flexible. So, so there's that. Then we've got something called a partnership. So what is a partnership? As the name kind of says it, it's two or more people working on a partnership, on, on a business together. So that's really cool because then you have a partner, right? So you're working on a business together. Uh, the there's various types of partnerships, but I'm going to talk about this one that I'm talking about, which is the two or, two or more people working on a, part, on a business together. The issue about liability, still there with the partnership, okay? So there's no shield there. There's nothing protection saying, hey, I got a partnership. Don't sue me and sue the partnership. The partnership will get sued, but you will still be personally responsible. Here's another little tidbit to it. Um, there's a chat in there. So shout me out if, it, if, it's, if it's relevant. Uh, with with the partnership, if something if your partner does something, you're responsible for what your partner does so long as it's in the business in the business. So let's say you're 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 a gift maker. We'll use a gift maker, right? You're a gift maker, and you have your partner. Your partner decides to say, "Hey, I'm gonna go to Yeti, right? Yeti's that that cooler company. They make like coffee mugs and stuff like that. I'm gonna go to Yeti and place an order for like." A hundred thousand cups because I know we're going to get all these gifts because Christmas is coming. We're going to be ready. You, they create this contract on behalf of the partnership. You realize you don't have a hundred thousand gifts to give. You're still going to be on the hook, even though your even though your partner signed for it. So that's a big thing to watch out for. The question in the yeah, yeah. the question in the chat is: Does partnership apply to a husband and wife owned business? I would say so. I would say so. Husband and wife is kind of interesting with different, with like, with like, um, yeah, it would, it would. The, the rules that I'm just talking about would apply. Um, of course, there's a whole community property aspect to it. And then if we get into LLCs, it gets a little bit funkier with husband and wife because sometimes in the, for an LLC, which I'm going to talk about, it's, um, it's seen as one person. So it's, 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 it, can get, it can get a little confusing, right? So we have differences between tax and we have differences um, with, with how it's seen yeah. legally. Yeah, and so this is Michelle, um, who actually has two businesses, so she's kind of like you. She has a candle business, and she's also an event planner. Uh, but she did mention, um, she asks if, you're, if you recommend partnership over an LLC. She's thinking of converting from, sole, she's sole proprietor now that, uh, oh, her husband is joining her full-time. Well, congratulations, Michelle. So so you're certainly currently a sole proprietor thinking of kind of going into the partnership realm, um, I'm assuming for your candle company. Okay. But you tell. So, so yeah, no, th this is great because overall, when we're evaluating what type of business entity we should be, we think about it in two, two areas from my, from my view. We're thinking about it is legal protection one area, the other protection is tax planning. Now, in Michelle's situation, what she just described to me I would say for Michelle, it is more of like one person. So it doesn't really change much for you, but you'd want to think about if, if a husband's coming on, it might be that your, your company's growing. We might think about another, another thing for tax planning purposes, right? And everybody's different on the levels of risk, right? So some of us are more risk averse, I, I would say. Like, you know, we're more of like, okay, I don't, I'm not so worried about getting sued. That Alex example of getting sued for, by somebody. 
um, or some people are super highly concerned about it. And we'll talk about how we can get away from that. Uh, for Michelle's situation, it seems like if there's growth there, we might, we might want to be thinking about a couple things, which would be um, the tax planning side, like how would a corporation or an LLC help from a tax planning perspective? And two is like, at one point, do we spin off one company from the other? If there's two different things, because another thing that we didn't, we haven't talked about yet is when you have multiple entities under one company, the whole, the whole company is exposed. So if something happens on the event side, it can affect the candle side, or it can affect the, um, the gift, the gift side. So um, that's something else to consider. Can two entities be under one LLC? Yes. Yes, it can be. But just what I, what I just, what I just mentioned, you might not want to do it because yeah. if, if, if you have two different entities to, to doing two different things, now let's talk about like products is one reason and that this is going to get into the, some of the liability stuff we'll talk okay. about in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the next couple slides. But if you're creating something and then like some, some of us will source from another country, we'll source from, from other people. We're not completely solid on where we're getting it from. If something happens with some of those products and you have a great business on another vertical when you're doing something else and that's making good money, anything that happens on one side is going to affect the other. So you can nest two, but I really, I would really recommend doing an evaluation as to, does it make sense to, when does it make sense to spin it off? Like it makes sense means from a liability standpoint, but also makes sense from, you know, does it make sense to spend all that money on stuff? Cause you're, you're, you're going to start creating different people here. Um, so in terms of a, a, a from a in terms of, of a partnership, again, there's no liability shield here, right? So there's no protection. Anything that happens at the business, and remember I said you're also responsible for what your partners do, you're gonna, you know, you can be personally liable for stuff. The other thing is if you don't have an agreement in place, and of course me being the lawyer always recommends agreements, even if it's on, even if you don't get a lawyer to do it for you. It's better to have something in writing than have something orally, especially if you have a partnership where someone, someone says, I'm 70, 30, we're 60, 40. If you don't have an agreement, it's all seen equally. So actually the person who's a smaller, the smaller owner would get 50% share. They could change their mind and say, I, I never agreed to something less than 50. And the law says you can get 50, 50, unless you have the agreement. So always keep, commit stuff to paper. That's, that's one takeaway that I would have for you. So what do we do to protect ourselves against personal liability? Well, the clue is in the next, <laughs> the next entity here, which is we can create a corporation is one way. And there's two different corporations. Actually, there's three different corporations. And I jumped to professional corporations earlier uh, where, we can, where we can do stuff. And the first one's called a C corporation. Now, C corporation is a separate entity. It's a separate person under the law. So you're actually creating something separate that has its own name, has its own address, is, um, has its own tax identification number, basically its own social, and, and you put stuff under it. And when you do that, it separates your, your business from your personal. And that's how we create the protection. Now, when you do a C corporation, that's usually for something that's like from... Uh, for bigger companies, companies like, you know, like Apple, companies like Microsoft, Coca-Cola. Those are usually C corporations. Why? Because I just mentioned that the corporations are a separate person. As a separate person, when that separate person makes money, it, it has to report a profit. It has to pay taxes on it. But here's the other part of it. Even though it's a separate person, you own shares in that corporation. By owning shares in that corporation, you're the owner of it. So when it makes money, it pays taxes on it. And then it says, hey, we made money, it gives it to you. You got to pay taxes. Well, who owns the corporation? You do. So you're paying taxes twice. So how do we avoid that? We do something called an S corporation. And so when you think of the word S, think of, think of the word small, which is this is how we avoid it. And even professional corporations like therapy practices and other things like that can be S corporations. So when we do an S corporation, you make money, you only get taxed once. It all flows through to the shareholder. And so when you hear someone saying, I'm an S corp, that's what that means. And, 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 it, and, and there you have it. I'm going to sneak to the chat real quick, just to make sure. Um, the, question, 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the, the question that, that we haven't yet talked about was Denise's question and she's talking about LLC. So I thought maybe we would capture it when okay. you get to that section there. Um, but she did say, I'm a photographer and a homeowner, sole proprietor currently. Should I switch to an LLC to separate and protect my assets? Something I've been thinking about for a long time. Okay. So, so just to, just to button up ask corporations. So that, that's really, that's, so that, that's a big component of it. And I, corporation, yes. No, go ahead. I was going to say, and those are two like areas that are, they're pretty, there's a lot built into all of those. So if there's any other questions in those, we can definitely circle back, but those are definitely, like you said, kind yeah. of. There's a lot built into it. Yeah, definitely a lot built into it. Like, remember I'm saying you're, you've got a separate person. So sometimes I, I, I compare a corporation to like a, a plant, right? So it's a plant. You can't just, you know, even, even succulents, you can't just leave them by them without any kind of care. You, corporations, you got to give them some care, which means you got to maintain them. Under the law, you got to maintain them. And so, and so with, the, with, the, with the law, you have to kind of maintain them, which means you have to keep it updated. You got to pay your taxes. You got to report to the state once, once, once a year at, at a minimum once a year. You also got to do something called shareholder meetings. You got to have board meetings, stuff like that. So sometimes what people do is they want the protections of a corporation but they want the flexibility of a partnership because a partnership, like I mentioned, can be very flexible. You know, you do have, I do cook, I do recommend writing. I do recommend stuff in writing, but other than that, you can be very flexible as to how you, how you do it. So they came up with this thing called an LLC, which is a limited liability company. So it's a mixture of a corporation and a partnership. You get that protection, like our, like I think it was Denise who asked about it. Um, you get the protection of, of, the liability you're separating your personal from your business but then you have this this organization that's kind of still flexible so you don't have to report to the state you know once a year uh you actually have to report twice a you know uh every every two years uh you don't have to have these these meetings if you don't want to it's not required like that you still gotta pay your taxes you're never gonna get away from taxes no matter what form you're in by the way if you're gonna take one thing away from that just take this away you gotta pay taxes no matter what um um, so, so that's no matter what it is, but the LLC, the more flexible way, uh, to maintain a corporation, uh, without, uh, sorry, not maintain a corporation, maintain something where you're protecting yourself from liability without worrying about, um, all these other requirements. So a lot of people choose the LLC when we get, we get more complicated, complex with corporations, when we're talking about more of like tax planning or in the future, like if you wanted to go into that space where you're starting to give shares to other people, you're trying to do stuff like that, corporations are easier for that. So a couple of questions in the chat, but just to kind of clarify, even for, for Iris and I, so we have a partnership, which we, as Iris mentioned, fully drawn up and whatnot. Um, and then we're also an LLC. So what I think what we're talking about is, you know, making sure that we are, well, for us, anyhow, we have our agreement in terms of our business, but we have an LLC that also then protects us from the, some of the, the, what you described earlier around, you know, any issues that someone has with us in our business and, you know, protects our, our personal property from that. Is that correct? Right. So when you have an LLC, so sometimes what happens is we use, we use words interchangeably. So yeah. sometimes LLC people, owners and LLCs are called partners. Uh -huh. uh, so that happens. So when you have a partnership agreement, it might also be what we call your operating agreement, which is okay. your partnership agreement within your LLC, which kind of says, hey, this is how we're going to run things. This is how we have our ownership. This is how much we put in, whatever it says. So so, so that, that sometimes can create confusion. Yeah, I've even seen people who have corporations call themselves partners when they're really corporations and they should be officers or shareholders and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, I mean, I mean, one homework way would what for you would be kind of to see if everything's tied in, like the way I just described it, but, yeah. but it sounds like you're doing, you're on the right path. I hope so. Yeah, we are. We have the LLC and we have the operating agreement that marks out our roles, our percentages, um, as well. Yeah, exactly. And while we're on the S corp part, I see something from Noemi here. Yeah. So S corp is not a business entity. The, the business entity is a corporation. And then you decide whether or not you want to be taxed as, as a small business corporation or you want to be stay as a C corporation. 
So it's something you opt into. And by the way, if you do this on your own without the help of a lawyer or a tax person, you only have a certain amount of time to get that S corp. And if you don't get it, you either have to beg for forgiveness from the IRS, which says, hey, I messed up, I missed the time limit, or you wait till your next tax year, which would be in your next, next 2023. Oh, um, intermittent R dash here, it's two days period. And then another great question, which is about to lead to it, which is with Melanie, is yes, as LLCs, you can be taxed, you can choose to be taxed as an S Corp. If you don't, um, uh, and if you don't uh, do that, um, eh, sorry, eh, LLCs, you can be taxed as an S Corp, but if you don't, and I just skipped my slides, by the way, you got, you got preview. Uh, if you don't, that, that means I don't know how to use my mouse, FYI. Um, if you don't choose to be taxed as an S Corp, so let's use, let's use Iris and Patty as an example. If you don't choose to be taxed as an S Corp, you're taxed as a partnership, okay? So what does that mean? That goes back into the whole situation of self-employment tax. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, um, you gotta, uh, you gotta claim it as self-employment tax. S corporations are kind of interesting in that with an S corporation from a tax standpoint is you can actually choose to, to actually establish differences in pain periods. So, and I'm gonna take a step back and say with an, like with an LLC, if you're taxed as a partnership, that means all of your earnings is seen initially as employment earnings. And so you can't really separate the two. With an S Corp, we actually can separate some stuff and it creates, it creates potential savings there from a tax perspective. I think that's, you know, the hard part here is like there's the, the legal part and then there's the the tax part and you can't, you know, unsee that, right? <laughs> you, you have to look at it from both the benefit, like from a legal uh, um, protection side and then also what makes sense for you from a tax side. And so it is helpful to kind of get, um, you know, the, the double benefit, if you will. And I've, you know, I, you know, Iris and I have been doing your taxes the last couple of years, always as partnerships. So now it's like, piqued my interest like ooh what's this um escort benefit right right because when your revenue gets to a certain part and you have revenue from other streams then you want to be able to kind of separate the revenue right to kind of lower your tax bracket well you want to separate the revenue and then you also want to consider um you know potentially creating the creating a payroll like start to payroll yourself create salaries for yourself yeah um, rather than just a profit share or getting a dividend from it. Um, there's there's ways to do this, like to kind of like kind of reduce your, your tax liability. Um, and you know, the good thing is you can continue to evaluate it as you grow. So so one thing is like, well, when do we how do we assess risk? Right. So that came up uh, as one of the questions in the chat is how do we assess risk? How do we figure out like how do I figure out that I shouldn't be a sole proprietorship anymore? Maybe I should be an S Corp. Or, or, or a professional corporation or LLC, whatever it is, is, well, it's gonna depend really on, like one is personal, right? So everyone has their own level of risk. So I can't tell you what's, you know, you ask me to jump out of a plane, I'm, I don't want to ever wanna jump out of a plane, okay? Just, I, let's just stop that right now. We'll never have an activity where I'm gonna to try to jump out of a plane, I'm sorry. Don't wanna do it. So that's my level of risk aversion, right? I'm sure many of you are in agreement with me and some of you are like, oh, that's fun, let's go do it. So, but that's kind of the personal side of it, right? So you got to figure out what the kind of it, it is. Um, but the, it also depends on your activities. Certain activities, you, you know, are going to be more risky than others. So and what does risk mean? Risk means the possibility that you're going to get sued for something. So if you're engaged in, in let, let's say there was, there's someone who, who made candles, right? So candles are flammable. Um, so that's probably a riskier thing than someone who provides, uh, I don't know, coasters like table coasters or, or charger plates, you know, stuff like that. That's, that seems to be less risky than that. So that, that's kind of last part of the, the, the way you have to do. But also if you're a service provider, let's talk about that for a minute. If you're a service provider providing a service, your risk is going to be different. And some of your risk is still could be potentially personal to you, which I'll get to in um, our next slide. Uh, benefit corporations, by the way, it's just another designation. It doesn't, it's not a separate corporation. So, but we could talk about that. That's kind of like, if you want to give back, 
part of your profits is somewhere and worried about other owners getting mad at you for doing that, you can become a B Corp. It's also was popular for like three years for like, you know, for, for our marketing purposes. But a big benefit corporation that you'll all know about is Patagonia is one of them. It's one of our California-based benefit corporations, the B Corp. Um, a honest company is, we used to be a benefit corporation. I'm not sure if they still are because they went public. Jessica Alba's company. Um, but they were a benefit corporation. Ben and Jerry's was like the first benefit corporation ever. Um, they're still a B Corp. So the idea of that is if you had more owners in your corporation, the duty of a corporation is to make money for its shareholders. And if you're just going to say, hey, we're going to take some of the money we made, give it to a charity, you could be in violation of your duties. And so you'd say, we're going to be a B Corp and we're actually going to write it into our paperwork that money's going to go out to charities. That's what a benefit corporation is. And I already feel like I spent so, too much time on it, but we can always talk about it on a later chat. <laughs> Let me get one, to the next one. One last yeah. question, Justin. I think it's a, it's a short one here. It came in from prior to the meeting. Um, started, uh, is there a fee waiver for the LLC? There's some you know, discussion about that there's a fee waive the first year. And does that, so, do you, go ahead. Mm, so, so to register your, your L, in California, we'll stick in California because I know some of you might be working in multiple states, uh, but we'll stick with California. In California, to register, you're going to be charged a fee. What's probably the referencing is the, what, another thing called the fee, but it's really a tax, is like, what's your minimum tax? Each corporation or an LLC, you owe the state of California $800 every year. They, until 20, I want to say till the end of 2023, uh, we can double check that. We can talk about it when I double check it. It's either through the end of this year or, or the end of next year. Uh, the eight hundred dollars is not due to the next year. So if you started it tomorrow, you start LLC tomorrow, you don't pay them eight hundred dollars until next year. Um, about two years ago, in 2019, 2020, you would have to pay the eight hundred dollars as soon as you start. And the eight hundred dollars is a minimum fee, no matter what, whether you make. A hundred thousand, you make zero zero dollars. You have to pay eight hundred dollars. That's the same thing for corporations, but corporation has it built into it that the first year is waived. So the LLC one, they've done it temporarily. They have they didn't they haven't extended it yet. So the, that's probably the reference to what they were asking about. Denise is asking: Is the eight hundred dollar fee only for LLC? So I think maybe Denise, are you asking: Is there a fee for the other filings as well? There's a fee for there's a fee for corporations. And it's 800 minimum. Okay. And it, it, it goes, it bumps up based on how much you make in a year. Okay. So we talked about, we talked about limited liability, right? Right. We talked about how these LLCs, these corporations can help you limit your liability, but there are ways around, you know, limiting your liability, right? There's ways that uh, if someone's upset with you or wants to sue you, or that you can be res personally responsible. And I was getting to this with my other chat. And the first thing is self-negligence. Well, one, is what, what I mean by self-negligence is, let's say you part of your job is to deliver your product somewhere, right? So you have a delivery truck, you get in an automobile accident with somebody, and you're going to get sued by someone you got an auto, automobile accident with. Now, you can't just say, hey, talk to my LLC, because my, it's, my, it's under my LLC, because you were personally driving the car, you're going to be responsible. Same thing, this would also extend to people who provide services. So if you make a mistake in your service, sometimes we call that malpractice, you'd be personally responsible. So there's, there's another reason why some people choose not to do uh, an LLC right off the bat, bat or a corporate off the bat because they're like, well, most of the work I do, I'm gonna be responsible anyway. Why do I need a, a corporation or LLC? Unless it's gonna help me from a tax perspective. Another thing is something we call personal guarantees. And you'll see this, a lot of you are in the event space. Sometimes they're even in the event space, when you're signing the contract, you might be thinking you're gonna sign based on your corporation. Okay, cool, I'm gonna put my LLC down. But the last two pages of the contract says, hey, we want you to personally guarantee that if your LLC can't pay, you're gonna pay. You'll see this a lot, not just in events, but you'll see this a lot if you need, need to rent a space, you need to lease a space, that's gonna be there. Um, where if you personally guarantee something, you can't just say, can't fall back on your corporation LLC and say, hey, I'm not responsible because you just guaranteed that that was going to happen. 
also happens with loans. So if you get if you get business loans of a certain amount, they'll 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 have you do that. Another thing that where someone can say you're not you're not protected from a from a liability standpoint is something called commingling. That means when you're mixing your business money with your personal money. Now this is really going to be important for our LLC and our corp people. It's a little bit different when you're sole proprietor because your money's all it's the same. So let's not think about the sole proprietor side. But if you're an LLC, you got to keep your business money separate from your personal money. Once you mix it up, someone sues you. They're going to say that you know you're treating it as your own personal piggy bank and not as a separate person that we've been talking about. So be careful with commingling. Another thing to talk about is undercapitalization. What does undercapitalization mean? That's a super long word. <laughs> a super long word to say you don't have money in your company and you're intentionally keeping money out. So let's say you're successful now. This is year four. I'm going to say year four because I don't know why year four is going to be very successful for you. But for all of you on this call, it's going to be very successful for you. Um, you're making tons of money. But instead of you keeping it in the company, as soon as you get the money, you're pushing it out to your personal stuff. That's called undercapitalization because you're trying to keep your company at zero. So in case you get sued, you'd be like, go for it. Go sue the company because the company has no money. Courts don't like that. They'll come after you personally. Another thing is called if you don't have insurance, right? You don't have the proper insurance. You're either underinsured you're, or you, you, you don't have the right insurance. You can also be personally liable. I'll stop there because we have uh, the chat's buzzing. Yeah, so Gary asked, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, in addition to the $800, do I need to establish payroll with a company like ADP along with a business bank account for payment deposits? Well, definitely a business bank account and establishing a payroll would be great. Uh, it would be great to do because it's, it's going to help from a, from a tax perspective for you. But that's kind of like everything's very personal to what you what your plan is to do with your company. And this is why we take this kind of team approach um, I, I'm, I'm talking some tax stuff here, but I usually when I work with my clients, I say, let's, let's bring your tax person in there if you have someone, because we want to make sure that we're all in alignment with what we're doing. But um, yeah, and Gusto is what I use as well. I, I wouldn't really go ATP myself. Um, um, I, I use Gusto as, as well, and I always recommend that to my clients. I haven't seen another payroll company right now that, that works easily. It's very seamless, and, and my accountant loves it. Um, so, yeah, I know. Um, I see it. Is that is that what we're talking about? Uh, I'm going to jump to Anna's question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, well, <laughs> just missed it. Okay. So, uh, want me to read can, Anna's? So, no, I got it. I got okay. it. So, so for a Cal in California, you can't use a PO box for your business address. They want a physical location. Now, many of you are working from home or have a home-based business, and you don't have like an office office or a, a warehouse or, or a storefront, whatever it may be, um, you, you have to use a physical address. So, and you might not want to use your home. So you have to find a location that will allow you to use your physical address. Uh, uh, the, the state doesn't really, doesn't like you to use PO boxes. You can use PO box for mail, um, but, but you do have to use a physical address. Yeah, you could do an owner's draw, but I would talk to the tax person on it. Um, that, that, that's fine, you can do an owner's draw. Um, virtual address may not work. So a virtual address may not work. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to like a, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of both virtual addresses. They get, they get kicked back. Home address is okay. Some people choose not to use a home address because of, for privacy purposes, it is going to get publicly listed. So if someone looks up your corporation, your LLC, they can find out where you live. And so sometimes you'll use a place like a we like a WeWork might work, a WeWork for, might work for this. Um, back when I was first starting out in my own office, I had something called the Regis. Regis is still around, um, where you can use where it's a physical address and you can actually get it. Um, there's also something called a registered agent, which we didn't talk about here, um, but you can use a third party to actually take any kind of legal paperwork on your behalf and send it to you. Okay, so what do we have here? Okay, next thing I'm going to go to next is what are what liability? Because I want to give some more time for for uh, for some 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 free free flow questions. All right. So what what liability issues can you face? Well, first one we'll talk about really briefly is premises liability. That's if you have a space and someone comes onto your space 
and gets hurt, okay? Uh, Americans with Disability Act is another one related to having the space uh, and someone who has, a, who has a condition or some kind of condition, they come to your space and there's, it's, it's, a, it's, an in, it's an industry right now, unfortunately, where there's some people who are taking advantage of the, of the rules for ADA rules and you can get sued for that. Contract disputes for that. That was one of my examples, right? Where you order something and then you don't like what you got and you 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 get you, you have a fight over it. And of course, malpractice, I talked about that. Misfeasance is 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 basically have you have a duty for something and you do it wrong. Employee liability is very, very big because that could be different things. You have sexual harassment, you have discrimination, you have workers' compensation. So there's a bunch of different stuff there. Uh, wage an hour. Uh, you're not paying your employees, you know, properly and on time. That's why you got to use something like Gusto. I've seen stuff, by the way, please definitely use a payroll. This is a side note, but please use a payroll company once you start establishing a payroll and you have other employees on. I've seen people try to do their own payroll stuff and my God, it's not a good thing. That's an expense that you got to make sure you budget for at some point. For okay. contractors, like for like help that you don't have like as full time, but you just have occasionally... Is that still okay to manage off? Like yeah, no. you have to yeah, you have to kind of do it based on like on, on the numbers, right? So I, I've seen the the one I was like about to like have a heart attack <laughs> right now was more of like you know like they're running they're paying their taxes because you have to pay payroll taxes. Every time you run a payroll, you have to pay a tax and you have to kick it to the state. And if you don't do it right, then the state says, hey, you're you underpaid us, and guess what? You haven't paid us for six months, so we have interest on it. Like that kind of stuff. Contractor payment. If you hire someone to do a project, you just cut them a check. That's that's easy. And even if it's bigger than that, that they that they do a certain amount of hours for you, that 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 seems pretty straightforward for me. Got it. And the question in the chat is about contracts, so we'll we'll get to that. I think we have a slide on contracts. So we'll get to yours in a minute, Denise. Okay. So all right. So ways to protect against liability. Well, one is insurance, but remember all, all insurance is, there's not one insurance policy that covers everything. So you really gotta, uh, from my perspective, work with someone who knows your business and can help you get covered because there's gonna be different insurance. The things, there's different things that I've discussed so far that, that requires insurance. Workers' compensation is one set of insurance, but then there's all these other employee issues I brought up. Those are different sets of insurance. We talked about someone getting an automobile accident. Well, you got to have insurance, not just from your car, but does your is your business covered on that insurance? So just know that one size does not fit all with insurance. A broker or someone knowledgeable in that field is going to help you. Well-written policies is a way to protect against liability because um, if you have like people helping you and you have well-written policies of the way you do things, then it's going to be hard for people to make mistakes. I always like to use this with the physical part because that's going to be important. Like, let's say you had a warehouse of, of your goods and you, 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 you basically had a well-written policy that people review and people know as to how they move things, right? So how do you move things? Then you're not going to have people getting hurt because they're trying to lift boxes without using the, you know, the forklift and stuff like that. Properly drafted contracts. Yes, having properly drafted contracts is important to have and that's going to help you. So don't do stuff off of Google if you can help it. Rocket Lawyer is something I don't recommend. They always, I've always seen their stuff. Their stuff is terrible. Um, I know it's being recorded and hopefully, you know, I don't get anything beyond this, but <laughs> their stuff is terrible. Um, and because I always, there's always mistakes in it. So it, it's, it's really bad. You really want stuff custom for you. And yes, of course, if you're having an event, and I think this is part of Denise's question, having a liability wa waiver is going to protect you. It's not it's not 100 protection, but of course it's gonna it's gonna protect you, especially if you're saying, hey, you're coming onto the space. Uh, we did a lot of when people were kind of transitioning. I mean, there's still like you know we still we have a potential surge happening soon, or it's happening now in terms of COVID. But when we were doing when people were transitioning from like full on lockdown to like starting to do stuff, we I worked with a lot of clients on COVID waivers and stuff like that because we were trying to let people know, hey, you're coming in. You know, and I'm not sure, I forgot what, you know, different levels of like testing and stuff were, were available or not. But, you know, what you want to wait, make people that aware of like their protections in place, but know that's not 100%. Um, but it's, it's definitely a protection that you can add. Uh, last thing on this part, on this portion of the slide is, is having them in, in protecting intellectual property that you may have and making sure you don't infringe on other people's intellectual property. 
make sure you're not stealing. For lack of a better way to say it, I'll say it more casually, don't steal people's ish. Um, so like, don't steal their logos, don't steal their copy, don't steal any of their stuff. Um, and because that can cost you some money. Photos is a big thing. Some of you are, some of you may be using photos and even stuff like, I don't know the companies out there, but there's companies that say they'll give you a license for photos. Be careful with some of those because some of those are not completely clear because I've had clients have those issues. That's a good point um, around photos and whatnot. And, you know, we may have like a verbal commitment or text message or something like that, but uh, you're right. Making sure that we've got the proper, um, cause that is intellectual property to your point. Yeah. And, and when you're doing it, cause you're, 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 so a lot of you are in the event space. So doing events, stuff that you, you see major companies do so i would I, you know follow what the major companies do if you don't have like an event right where you have people sign off on it because your event right could say like have little terms and conditions to say hey we're taking photos of this event know that your likeness might be used etc 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 you can also make sure you have something at the at the in the front of the event when people get their get their name tag right it says hey your photos might be utilized you know if you don't yeah. like it go home essentially yeah, that's true um, and so that's that's how you kind of can waive your stuff. But also, I just want to reemphasize this we're on photos is using, um, getting stuff when you're building a website, when you're building yeah. an event and you're saying, hey, I'm going to pay, you know, $15 for these photos. Sometimes those photos are not completely clear. So be, be wary of the, of the source you're getting it from. Um, there is a, um, another contract question that came in from previous. Uh -huh. And actually, Anna, I think if you're still on the line, you can um, speak to it. But one of them was uh, that, and Anna, feel free to, to speak, but you're, you're asking if, a, um, if someone signs a contract by hand versus on their phone, is that still legally binding or do you have to use like a DocuSign or some legal software in order to make it legal? No, it's, it's legal unless they're making a claim that they didn't, they didn't sign it. Right. So then they'd have to, they'd have to dock you something like DocuSign or Adobe sign or hello sign. Um, it, it, they're verifying it through the processes, through their accounts. They're verifying that they've gone click through it. So that's where you get a little bit more protection in place with electronic stuff. Um, but, uh, but a hand signature would, would work unless they're saying, you know, it wasn't me. It was my daughter and my daughter is only 12 or something. Yeah. Carla has a question. Yes, can I just ask her? Of I think. course, yes. Okay. Um, hi, Alex. Thank you so much for all the information. I think I got some, I gained some clarity. I'm currently a sole prop. DBA, my business uh, company is Kiss and Say I Do Events. I'm a wedding planner. Um, so I today I already decided that I'm going to become an LLC and I'm going to elect to be taxed as an escort, period. But my question is, I know I have to, um, since I already have a DBA, can that same name be transferred to the LLC or would that be a problem? Well, you'd have to, so there's two different, it's great question and congratulations. I'm glad I, uh, you're going to the LLC with an escort kicker. <laughs> um, um, so you, it's two different entities, right? Your DBA is probably with the county and and you're you're going to talk to the state of california so as long as the state of california clears it you can use it oh, okay perfect and, and so there's a way to search for the name with the state of california secretary of states where you where you do the search and but you you should be able to use utilize it one thing this is it brings a second question that comes up you can't use your same tax number so sometimes if you're a sole prop you get a, a, a an ein I do. You can't, you, you can't use the same EIN. You've got to get a new EIN for your LLC. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Michelle, you came on camera. Did you have a question? Yes. Okay. So it's kind of going back to, I'm the one that has the candle in the planning business. So both are licensed and they're separate. I think I'm more concerned about the candle business. So my question is, I didn't know about that you needed to publish a physical address for the LLC. So 
is there a downside? Because I do already have my home-based business license for my county requires that. Downside in posting our address if we are going to convert to an LLC and it is our home address or should I start? I'm just not ready for a space yet because our garage has been converted into a candle studio. So is there a downside in publishing our address for this LLC and it's our physical home address? So what was the second business? My second business is a planning business, my planning oh, business. Planning, okay, sorry. So I'm a, okay. I'm a wedding planner. I've done that for 17 years. That's completely separate. Um, my candle business is newer. It's two years in, but we are in retail already. So I was required to get double insurance and certain mm -hmm. things because we are in big box retail. So, mm -hmm. but, and that's why I was also required to get like um, home, certified by my county and my city for a home-based business when we converted the garage into a candle studio. So if we become an LLC, and we keep it in my home, I guess I'm, I didn't know that I had to publish because I have a PO box. I didn't know I had to publish my address and I'm wondering if there's a downside to that. The, the downside is privacy. That's the <laughs> only downside. So if you're not, if you're not um, worried about it, then it, it, it's fine. Um, I have, um, and everybody's different on that level of privacy, right? So in my, I've, I've been doing this for over 20 years, how many people have come to my client's house? I haven't, I don't remember an instance that happened, but everyone's different, right? Because it could, things could happen. Things are, the world's kind of crazy. So um, that's the only downside is really okay. privacy um, more than anything. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then there. you yeah. didn't recommend um, me lumping the two entities under LLC because I've gotten mixed responses. I have paid for consulting and I'm not getting a clear consensus on branching the two businesses under one LLC. My recommendation of not keeping it under was more for liability purposes and based okay. on like, if you have like a growing business that's really got a big, big, a big following or uh, you, you have a lot of customers there, if something goes you know, wrong on the other side of the business or vice versa, they're both exposed. That's the only reason, but you got to evaluate it, right? So if your planning is, is not, and even though you've been doing it a long time, it's, it's there, but it's, 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 it's a supplement more than anything, then maybe it's not that big of an issue. And then you get it, you can get insurance to kind of layer it, right? So sometimes that happens, right? So you get, you still get insurance to back up. So if something does go wrong for the planning, you have insurance for the planning. Okay. Thank you. All of this has been super helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'll get to Anna's second question and then Denise had a follow-up. Um, so Anna has a terms and conditions, terms and agreements document for her wedding invitation clients that she sends them with their invoice. Uh, can the invoice state that once they make the payment, they agree to the terms and conditions or does it need to be a signed contract? I, I like the signed contract. I like I like the sign contract. Um, so if they don't sign off on something, it, it, it's it's important that you have some kind of acknowledgement. And and notice it when you even like get something off your your app store, whatever whatever device you use, and you do the app store, you sometimes see a pop up that says, "Do you agree to these terms and conditions?" So that's an acknowledgement. So if you create that technology, or the technology is there where you have a pop up, that's different. But as opposed to saying, like as opposed to just saying, hey, there's terms and conditions I already sent to you, you agree to it, that may not be sufficient. So it's opting right? in. Your, like your protection is better than have, have them sign it. And the, this was a good situation where you were doctor sign with help because it makes it easier for people to, in the printout or sign stuff. They can just click a click twice. And I see that you un, unmuted yourself on it. So any other question? Okay, no, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to make sure if I was doing that correctly, but that makes complete sense. Thank you. You're welcome. And then I think I would just follow up with Denise. Denise, it doesn't have to be super complicated in terms of your contracts. You had a question on like, you have to get it notarized and, 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 and like have a lawyer do it. Not necessarily, obviously as a lawyer, 
I'd love to, you know, if we can help you, we'd love to, we'd love to be your lawyer, everyone's lawyer, um, because that, you know, we, we make money off of that, but, but not everything has to be like super legalized for it. Um, but, you know, it's just a matter of making sure you have a good record. Notaries, by the way, let's talk about notaries real quick. I know, I know we're kind of tight on time, but let's talk about notaries, notaries really quick is a notarization. And especially if a lot of us come from different communities and different cultures, notaries in different cultures mean a lot more in, in, in the U S notaries are just people who verify signatures. That's all they verify identities and signatures. They don't have any other weight other than that. Okay. So just keep that in mind um, when you're thinking about notarizing stuff, but it is helpful when you like, like to have like a notary is like a witness. So sometimes if you feel like you need a witness, a notary would be good for that, but they, there's no like legal weight. Like they don't verify your contract or something like that. Very and, helpful. And, and Melanie has her hand up. So yes, it is for the EIN. So I, I have an EIN for my business and, um, my concern was that I wanted to establish the business and start obtaining business credit. And so I was going to get my DUNS number, but I have been on the fence about getting an LLC because I make maybe like, it varies as far as how much I make per month. Some months I have like good months and then some months I make nothing. So for me, it was, whether or not I should convert to an LLC and then establish my business credit or stay as a sole proprietor and establish the business credit. Yeah, I, it, so it, it's really like a, a, a personal decision for yourself. Uh, the one thing I can tell you is that the, the, you, the EINs don't transfer. So, so if you have credit under one, it, it may transfer because you can basically say you assumed it. I don't know. You'd have to check with like Duns on it or other other like other banks that could help you with like to figure that out. Because you could say you have a history as a sole prop and just show that. And but unfortunately, your EINs don't transfer. And they don't go away, by the way. They just kind of like you just do a final return on them. And if, if you're done with it and then you don't you never close an EIN. You can close a business, but you never, it's weird. So that brought up another question for Michelle. She's asking, as it brings me to another one, is, is it worth filing and converting to an LLC if you're not making enough to justify the $800 filing each year? Only if, yeah, yeah only if, from my perspective, only if you're worried about risk. So if you're worried about, if you have a house and you're worried about protecting the house, then yeah, it might be worth 800 bucks as like insurance. Right. Um, but if, if you're not worried about risk and you, you don't have enough revenue to justify it, um, then yeah, it doesn't make sense to do it. I mean, and, and that's why we, when we have the questions of like, the, I think it was from Michelle's example, like that's why when we're saying like, like in a, in a true like law school sense, yeah, separate everything, right? But we also gotta be realistic if like, you know, you're, you have two different, uh, you know, areas of business and the second area of the business, you're just growing it and it's not super big. Don't create an LLC right off the bat um, if, if, if you don't need to. And that kind of leads us as we're kind of closing out and whatnot um, to a future workshop that we're hoping to bring you, which is the tax side of things. Um, I know we all have a lot of questions on that side as well. And so in that similar network um, that uh, Alex and I met in, there's uh, someone else who's, who's ready and willing to come on and help talk us through some of our tax questions and really getting the most out of these investments that we're making. Um, uh, so that will come I, you know, at a later time, we'll have to get him on board, but he's also a, a really great resource that we're excited to, to bring you guys. Um, but with that, uh, I don't think there's any more questions in the chat, but um, if there are, feel free to let us know. Any last words, Iris, as we wrap up? I am like so filled with so much great information because, you know, Patty and I have been doing this for a while. And even through this, you know, um, we're learning something new. So I think owning a business, it's not something like you learn once 
and then you like go off and you know do it successfully you have to keep learning it it's always great to have a resource and have an attorney there so having someone like Alex to navigate you through it um, is definitely well worth the investment so um, I want to say thank you for everyone for being so vulnerable and asking your questions and thank you Alex um, for giving us all the answers that we need to get us through wherever we are in our next level of our business. I second that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you, everyone on the line for sharing. Um, I learned a lot from all of you as well. And so um, hopefully this was able to be helpful to you. Um, Alex, since we're sending out your deck, there's your email address is there. So I, I'm sure you'll get some follow up questions. He's very active on Twitter, too. So if you want just like a fast <laughs> response, feel free to just message him and <laughs> he'll get it, right it back. Might, it might be quicker to at me on, <laughs> on Twitter than to call the That's office. Like, uh, actually, it's probably at me on Twitter, call the office, and then call me at least twice, and then email me. <laughs> um, yeah. if, if, uh, anyway, thank you all for having me. I uh, appreciate being here, and I, I really uh, wish you all good luck on, on your journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Take care. We'll see you all soon.